Good morning, Redeemer from Groton, Connecticut. It's good to be with you on this Father's Day. And my wish for you is that uh, you will have a good Father's Day as you celebrate the men in your life, whether they be your real father or father-like figures. And uh, today, especially as we celebrate our Father in Heaven who loves us so dearly. All right, we're going to begin with our prelude, which is um, Lift High the Cross. Connecticut, it's good to be with you this morning, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers in our congregation and viewing audience today. The cost of discipleship. Those looking for an easy way shouldn't follow Jesus. He climbed a cross, and from that place, he beckons us to follow him, and we do. Proclaiming the kingdom of God has arrived in his person. A proclamation that puts the world at risk. And the world pushes back. Attempting to reduce the wonder of the message by claiming that it's irrelevant. irrelevant. Jesus was crucified because his message was a threat to the establishment. And we can expect the same. But we continue to proclaim, for our God is stronger than the world, and ultimately, through him, 
we are triumphant. If you have some prayer requests you would like included in our prayer section of the service, please make sure that you send those in early so that Terry can record them and be ready at that time. And so today we come together as we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you grant us peace through suffering, hope in darkness, and eternal life. We are grateful that you know us and that we can know you. We can't imagine our lives without you. And so we thank you for reaching out to us as your children. And we pray in the name of our brother in Christ, Jesus. Amen. Let's join together now as we confess our sins together in the words of the common confession. Most merciful God, we confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. My dear friends, Almighty God in his mercy has had mercy upon us and has given his son to die for us and for his sake he forgives us all of our sins. Therefore as a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading today is from the sixth chapter of Romans beginning at verse 12, where Paul tells us that we were once slaves to sin, but now we are slaves to righteousness. Paul writes, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your bodies in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefits you reap lead to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading. And our reading today from the Gospel, our Gospel reading is from the 10th chapter 
of Matthew. Those who are followers of Jesus can expect to be persecuted just as he was. But we face that persecution not in fear, but in the knowledge that God cares for us. Jesus sent the twelve out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town with the Samaritans. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is, it is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill, can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now it's time for our children's message, so I would invite you to gather all the children around. And as I said earlier, I'm in Groton, Connecticut, so I'm very blessed today because I happen to have three generations of Ensley's with us today. I have myself and my son Jesse and my grandson Justin who just graduated from high school this weekend and we're so proud of him. And we'd like to share some thoughts with you today regarding Father's Day and about our fathers. And I thought I'd probably start first and then I'll wrap things up too but we're all going to share some thoughts about our fathers. So as I think about my dad, he's been gone now for 16 years. We just we just remembered that date earlier this month that dad died in 2004. But when I think of my dad, I think of someone who loved me unconditionally, someone whom I knew was always there for me. He was an example to me in service and he was also an example to me in Christian life. And I thought of this verse when I thought of my dad from Proverbs, from 1424. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. And as I continue to think about that, I know that the Christian heritage that my father gave to me is certainly a refuge for me and will be for all of my life. And so I thank God for my father, and I thank him for the teaching that he gave to me. Actually, both of my parents, I can't just say my father only, but I thank them both for the Christian heritage that they gave to me and uh, the peace that comes from knowing that I'm a child of God and that someday we'll be together again in the mansions of glory. Now, you're going to get to hear from Jess next. You're going to hear from my son, Jess, next, as he talks about his dad. Maybe we can get them both in there. There we go. Well, good morning, Redeemer. 
Good morning, little ones. I appreciate you guys taking time today. And as uh, as my dad was saying, um, what do I sit back and think of when I think of my dad? Um, Joshua 24:15 definitely sums it up. It says, "As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord." You know, my my dad has has taught me um, that service to others is extremely important. The world is bigger than what we have in front of us. And to, to go out and be good stewards of all the blessings that we've gotten, that we've received, and to make sure that we are stewards of that and pass it on. I would also like to take a second and read Deuteronomy 6 through 9. These commandments I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk, walk along the road. When you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols to, on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So that is definitely something that I see from my mom and dad who have uh, taught me how to um, serve and praise God and how to realize that, uh, that once again, the, the world is, is much bigger than just ourselves. Good morning, everybody. So when I was looking at these verses, one that caught my attention was Proverbs 4, chapter 1 through 2. And it says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound of learning, so do not forsake my teaching. I thought, of, I thought this one caught my eye because... I listened a lot to what my father said, and I've gone through a lot of hard times with what he's told me to do and giving me advice on, I guess, struggling on day-to-day -day things. And that one really reflects on how I see my dad. Another one was Proverbs. 27 the righteous lead blameless lives blessed are their children after them my I believe my dad is a very selfless character and very giving towards other people and it reflects on I feel like it reflects on me a lot because now I kind of want to. Now I want to do good to others and everybody else as well, and be more like my dad and be kind of just nah, nice to everybody. Well, thank you, Justin, and thank you, Jesse, for sharing your thoughts with us together today, and. Um, we don't all have the benefit of having great families. Sometimes our families aren't and our fathers don't have the memories that we would like to. But we know that we do have one father who loves us unconditionally and that's our father in heaven. So in this Father's Day, as we think about him, as we think about the God we worship and praise, let us also always remember that he loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, into this world so that we might have forgiveness for our sins and that we might have life. God bless you all today as you celebrate this Father's Day, and I thank you that Ari and Alyssa and Luke and James and Noah and Molly and... Yeah. Noah and all the, all the wall children are here. Okay, they were crossed out, but now they're here, so welcome back, and, uh, and God bless your day. We continue now with our next...
song, which is His Eye is on the Sparrow, which was reflected in our Gospel reading. Why should I feel despairing? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the spell, well, I know he watches. bring you greetings, my friends, in the name of our Father, God, who loves us unconditionally. Amen. Our text today is the reading from Matthew that I shared with you a few moments ago. The world in which Jesus and his disciples lived in, first century Palestine, was far from the world that we experience today as Christians. In 325 AD, Emperor Constantine declared Christianity to, be, Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. And when that happened, Christianity lost a lot of its counterculturalness because up until that point, Christianity had been countercultural. Christians had been persecuted. Christians had been um, denounced. Christians had been um, um, persecuted. And luckily, that official religion nomenclature existed in much of the world until recently. Christianity was pretty much the official religion of the world. And even though here in the United States that um, 
that relationship was unofficial, unofficial, it existed. But in the last 50 years or so, things have changed a lot. And the alliance between the church and the, and the culture, well, today is all but gone. As Christians, we long for a return to those quote-unquote good old days when following Jesus didn't seem to be so hard or following Jesus didn't seem to require such a great sacrifice. Because the reality is that in early Christianity, in the early church, Christianity did require much pain and sacrifice. Christians lived in a hostile environment. But also by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church experienced enormous growth in those three first three centuries but that growth didn't come without great personal cost to many Christian men and women and yet today in our reading Jesus warns us that our biggest challenge as the church our biggest challenge as Christians will not come from the culture in which we live in but from our own families and that really seems harsh in our individualistic society. But in first century Palestine, the consequences were monumental for anyone who dared to embrace a new truth, anyone who dared to confess Jesus as God or Jesus as the Lord of their life. But that was also essential for the very survival of Christianity. You see, in first century, people thought of themselves much differently than what we're used, of, used to today. People thought of themselves as part of a group. And that seems so strange to us in our individualistic society. And oftentimes, the first century is misunderstood because we fail to grasp that basic truth. And that truth is this. To be separated from one's family was to be outside of the protection, outside of the security that was offered by your family. And for this reason, many people didn't leave home or they didn't rock the boat and they certainly didn't go against the cultural norms of their parents and of their society. That was the way that the culture had of offering protection from one generation to the next. And it also provided a way to keep that younger generation, quote unquote, in line. It wasn't possible for a young person to strike out on their own without the support and the protection of their family or of another powerful person. And that's exactly what Jesus is offering his disciples when he says, I will acknowledge before my Father those who acknowledge me. Jesus was explaining to them that the consequences of following him, the consequences of this new world order, the consequences of the new kingdom of God, which he was ushering in, his vision was radically different from the norms of the day. And for that matter, the norms of our day. And that following him, following the church would probably mean a break with family. It would mean a break with the traditions that they had known up until this time. It would mean a break with the culture. And it would likely get people kicked out of their families. Jesus doesn't demand that people break with their families in order to follow him, but he does warn us that following him will probably mean a break from what has up until now offered these people safety and protection and security. 
But in the midst of this unsettling revelation, we find the heart of the good news. That God values us. He values you. He says, do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus tells his disciples, and he tells us, that when we proclaim our allegiance to him openly, we need not fear. We need not fear those who can kill the body but cannot sever the relationship we have with God. A relationship that's much more than skin deep. A relationship that reaches to the very core of our being. We have a God and Father who knows and numbers the hairs on our head. And the implication is that if God cares that much about the little stuff, if he cares that much about the value of a sparrow, how much is he going to care about those who are his children, about you and I? And that's so important for us today as we live our daily lives in the post-cultural world, in the post-cultural church. We too can expect that following Jesus will become increasingly difficult. It will become an increasingly countercultural thing to do. We might find ourselves unpopular when we stand up for the care rather than the, the abuse of the creation that God has given us. We might find ourselves ridiculed when we proclaim Jesus as the Lord of our lives and then actually live our lives in a way that follows his will rather than the latest self-indulgent sweep that comes into our world. We might find ourselves shouted down by the forces that call for a violent response to protesters. We might find ourselves ridiculed if we call for a rethinking of our cultural norms in regards to racism or policing or equality. And we'll probably find that following Jesus leaves us out in the cold in other ways also. Even though we pride ourselves in being individualists, many of us fear being alone. We fear being isolated. We fear what happens when we don't conform to what everyone else is doing. We live in that culture of individualism, but we find our identity in a group that looks and acts and sounds enough like us to let us know that we're okay. In the same way, Jesus is reminding us that even though the world doesn't greet us kindly, so kindly as it once did 50 years ago as a church, we shouldn't be afraid. God's word will advance. It has for 2,000 years, whether we're the ones who carry it or not. God's love triumphs even over death, and that is shown to us in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus. God knows the details of our lives and of our world intimately and considers us of great worth even though we might feel small or insignificant against the culture or the powers or the forces of the world. And God encourages us so that when the time comes, we can stand up against the tide with a powerful affirmation of his love in, in the face of the indifference and scorn of the world. It takes great courage to stand alone. And eventually, after all of Jesus' disciples had left him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus stood alone also. He stood alone before the chief priests. He stood alone before Pontius Pilate and Herod. And he hung alone on a cross on a hill called Calvary. 
Only one who trusts in the promises of his Father in heaven could do such a thing. And he came through. Our Father in heaven came through on Easter morning for Jesus and for us. In Jesus' resurrection, we're offered a first-hand glimpse of the power of God's love as it faces down and wins the victory over death and evil. And we're offered solid evidence that Jesus' way, however daring and countercultural it might be, is the way of life. And we're called to stand together, and maybe even sometimes stand alone, in a world of class and hate and division and race. But unlike Jesus, we're really not standing alone. We have the promise of him who faced all these things before us and now faces them with us. And even though we might be slandered or criticized, we stand with him, even if it has to be apart from our very own families. We stand with Christ in a kingdom that envisions embracing all people as God's children. It's a vision that in value that values everyone a vision that finds its ultimate worth in Christ and that means that we find net worth or new worth and new value for all people it's a vision of love and forgiveness for everyone it's a vision of the creation restored to God's original intention it's a vision of God's people gathered around his table without distinction, each one being fed with the same holy food. It's a vision of life as it should be and life as it will be when we reach heaven. I find that vision exciting. I find that vision to be something that the world craves but one that only those who follow Jesus can give and in that vision we're all invited into something greater than ourselves and we're sent out to be what God has called us to be a community of faith that changes and transforms the world around us in Jesus holy name Amen. Please join me as we confess together our faith in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, this is the point of our service where we come to prayer, as we come to our Father in prayer. Let us pray. Faithful God, when we're fearful of our enemies and weary of the struggles of life. You are our shield and our strength. Grant us a full measure of your grace, that you would sustain us against all who are against us and help us to endure the trials and temptations of this world and this life, faithful to you until death. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we remember those who serve us in Jesus' name. Bless our leaders, 
our civil servants, our soldiers, and all church workers, that they may be faithful in their callings and honor you with an obedient life and raise up those who will follow in their steps and serve your kingdom in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Faithful God, give healing and strength to the sick and to all who are afflicted in, afflicted in mind or body, and grant to those who struggle the gift of peace of mind and heart. Hear us especially for those who have requested our prayers, Sandy Andriot, Charlotte Bryant, Joan Domro, Tom Egold, Ren Frank, Phil Habegger, Tonda Drinkard Helton, George Jones, Phil Koshua, Eric Schumacher, Carl Teese, Jonathan Snyder, Missy Warden, Janae Wheeler's sister Jody, who's suffering with COVID, restore our nation and the world in health and livelihood, and preserve us each day. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the families of our congregation and community, especially in this time of togetherness, that you would give us forgiving and loving hearts for one another, that we might treat one another with kindness and respect. We also lift up those who are celebrating birthdays in the coming week. Wayne Krieger and Doris Koshua and uh, Frankie's cousin Trey, whose birthday is today, his 17th birthday. We also thank you for a new baby that you brought into this world, a new life, Frankie's goddaughter, Tanikia, and uh, her newborn child, Tristan Carr Cortez. We also pray for Pastor Jeff, Jeff Geisler as he uh, proclaims his, the word of God for his last Sunday at Bethlehem and for the congregation of Bethlehem, our brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ, as they look for a new pastor to shepherd that congregation and fellowship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we live in a sin-filled world marred by injustice and intolerance and lack of compassion. We repent of our sins individually and collectively we pray for our community today that you would fill all people with your spirit of love and truth and justice. Point us all to Jesus and his life-saving sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Give us and forgive us and renew us that we might demonstrate your love and compassion and mercy in our words and in our deeds. We pray that you would keep our city and its people safe and that you would open our eyes and our ears to see one another in kindness and charity and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Faithful God, Father, sanctify us as your people and make us bold to confess you on earth. Lord, we thank you for being our Heavenly Father, and we thank you for the gift of fathers that you've given us here on this earth. Lord, we pray that you would bless fathers, that you would give them wisdom as they nurture and raise up your children, and we pray that you would bless families as they live together in your love. We also lift up our food pantry this week as they serve our community. Lord, may um, those who come to receive food for their body also receive spiritual food and experience the love that you as our Father give to your children here in this world. We pray for all graduates and especially for Justin Ensley who graduated from Fitch High School on Friday and all others who are graduating from preschools and grade schools and junior highs and high schools and college. Um, Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear prayer. our prayer. 
And we also give you thanks today that Elizabeth Grau was accepted into the University of Louisville Medical School. We pray that you would be with her in her studies in these next three or four years as she learns to be a doctor, that she might reach out to others with your love and with your compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear her. Her. Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and fill you with his peace both today and tomorrow and into eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Happy Father's Day, everyone. It's good to be with you today from Groton, Connecticut. Next week we will be in Massachusetts as we join together in worship for our Lord on the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Also, um, next Sunday, Terry and I will be hosting a Zoom online fellowship after the service, so please uh, be ready for that. We'll send out the information for that time as it grows closer. We will not be having our Zoom Bible study this Wednesday or next Wednesday as Terry and I are on vacation and out of town but uh, if you do need to talk to me or want to get a hold of me you can use my cell phone I have that with me 260-750-2526 you should have all been contacted this week by email and by your deacon and by uh, uh, maybe a text message about a survey that we're doing to get your opinions on reopening our a building for worship so please make sure that you take the time to go to that survey and fill that out so that we can get feedback from everyone as we make decisions concerning our future Ellen will be in the office this week on Monday and Wednesday and uh, you can get a hold of her there and also you can direct your gifts and offerings either through the US mail to Redeemer or to Redeemer through um, whatever we're using on our Facebook page. I forget now. PayPal, that's right, on our Facebook page. All right. God bless you. God bless your week. And may Jesus keep us all near him. And that is how we'll close our time out today. Jesus, keep me near the cross there, the precious fountain, free to all a living stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my Lord. Oh,
God bless you. See you next Sunday.